Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Unit 2, Lecture 3, Part 2. In the last video, we defined syllogisms as well as learned about the component parts of categorical syllogisms. In this lecture, we're going to learn the concepts of figure and mood. In our last lecture, we defined a syllogism as a deductive argument containing exactly two premises and one conclusion. A categorical syllogism is an argument in which each statement of the syllogism is a categorical proposition. Now because categorical syllogisms have three different propositions, we discovered that they must also have three distinct terms. The major and the minor terms are the predicate and subject of the conclusion respectively, while well, the middle term is the one that's repeated in the premises but is not in the conclusion. We also learned that the order of the premises is regulated by the conclusion. The premise containing the major term should always be the first statement of the argument, while the premise containing the minor term should always come second. Thus we call the first premise the major premise because it contains the major term, and the second is called the minor premise because it contains the minor term. Again, not because of their order, but rather because of their content. The terms that they contain are the subject and predicate of the conclusion. The building blocks of categorical syllogisms are the four categorical propositions, the universal affirmative, the universal negative, the particular affirmative, and the particular negative, the A, E, I, and O propositions. We also mentioned that the middle term of a categorical syllogism could either be in the subject or the predicate position of the premise in which it's found. In this video, we want to look more carefully at these two facts and see how they affect categorical syllogisms. The kinds of propositions a categorical syllogism is built from, and the orientation of the middle term in the argument, turns out to be essential to the success or validity of a categorical syllogism. So it's really important for us to understand the implication of these facts. We use the word mood to refer to the kinds of statements in a categorical syllogism, or the kinds of statements that the syllogism is built from. It's the English translation of the Latin word modus, meaning way, which was itself the medieval translation of the Greek word tropos, meaning kind, which Aristotle used to describe different types of syllogisms that might be composed from the four categorical propositions. And here we see three different examples, one which is an AAA mood, one that is an EAE mood, and one that is an IAI mood. Again, four categorical propositions which can be put together to form many different types of syllogisms. Given that each categorical syllogism is composed of exactly three categorical propositions, and because there are four different kinds of categorical propositions, there are going to be 64 different possible moods of categorical syllogisms that will exhaust all of the possible orientations of our four categorical propositions into syllogistic form. Now that we understand the concept of mood, which just tells us the letter or the name of the type of propositions a syllogism is made out of, let's turn our attention to the orientation of the middle term in categorical syllogisms. We use the word figure to refer to the orientation of the middle term in the major and minor premises of a categorical syllogism. Since each categorical proposition has two terms, a subject and a predicate term, and since there are two premises for each categorical syllogism, there are four possible orientations of the middle term. We label a categorical syllogism as being in figure one if the middle term is in the subject position of the major premise and the predicate position of the minor premise, as we see in this argument. We label a, a categorical syllogism figure 2 if the middle term is in the predicate position of both premises, as we see in this second syllogism. Similarly, we would label a categorical syllogism as being in figure 3 if the middle term is in the subject position 
of both premises. And of course, to round it out, we would label a categorical syllogism as figure four if the middle term is in the predicate position of the major premise and the subject position of the minor premise. So there are four possible figures for categorical propositions. Now, it may seem like a lot to get into your head, but there's actually a really, really easy way to remember the four figures, that is the orientation of middle term, in a categorical proposition. You know that I like to wear Oxford shirts and ties. I know they're ridiculous things in the grand scheme of things, but we all have a little bit of vanity. Well, we can actually use an Oxford shirt or a button-down shirt more specifically, the shape of the collar of a button-down shirt, as a reminder for the possible orientations of middle terms. Reduce it to its simplest elements. That reverse V-shape can be an image of the orientation of the four figures of categorical syllogisms. In figure one, again, we see the middle term is in the subject position of the major premise, while it's in the predicate position of the minor premise. In figure two, the middle term is in the predicate position of both. In figure three, we move the middle term over to the subject position of both. And in figure four, the middle term is in the predicate position of the major premise and the subject position of the minor premise. So if we lay them out in this form, we see our little shirt, shirt collar. Now, of course, only a small fragment of these argument forms, that is the moods and figures that we can put together, are going to turn out to be valid arguments. But we're going to talk more about that in the next video. For now, it's just important for us to learn the concept of mood, what kinds of propositions an argument is composed of, and the figure the orientation of the middle term in a particular syllogism. Given that we've got four figures for a categorical syllogism, and we've got 64 possible moods, we're going to end up with 256 possible categorical syllogisms that we could build. Again, only a very small fragment of these syllogisms are going to turn out to be valid syllogisms, and we're going to focus on that, or that's going to be the concentration of our next video. But this shows us all of the possible ways in which one could form a categorical syllogism. Okay, here's what we've covered so far. We've learned what a categorical syllogism is, as well as the parts, that is, the major, minor, and middle terms, along with the major and minor premises of categorical syllogisms. In this video, we've introduced two new concepts. We've learned how the kinds of propositions used in a syllogism compose its mood. And we've also learned how the orientation of the middle term is going to determine its figure. So next time, we're going to put all of this together, and we're going to be thinking about what it is that makes a categorical syllogism valid, that is, that the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises, or invalid, what goes wrong in the orientation of the propositions or the middle term to cause that argument to be invalid. We'll also use Venn diagrams to help us to demonstrate and to visualize the validity or invalidity of various possible categorical syllogisms. So, we'll see you next time.